The war in Ukraine has entered its third week. There have been a lot of developments over the past few days, advances on the ground in terms of in terms of military action, a lot of discussions as well, sanctions have been imposed, the economic consequences are going to be quite severe. We are going to be talking about all of this in Mapping Fault Lines. As we enter week three of the war, if we look at the situation, what we see, of course, is that some of the key axes from last time continue to be the same. There's an encirclement around Kiev. There's been a movement of forces around Kharkiv. A lot of action has been happening in the Black Sea regions where cities have been slowly being taken. Mariupol, of course, remains a key element, a key focus area as far as the Russians are concerned. There's been a lot of fighting around that area as well. But there have also been some discussions on the discussions happening between Russia and Ukraine, including at the foreign minister level, which is the highest that has taken place so far. So, Prabir, could you first give your own impressions of what you see as a situation on the ground and are these talks likely to bear fruit? You know, if you look, as you said, the situation on the ground, you can see the steady advance of Russian forces in different parts of the region. It's also very clear that those who expected a very quick military action, a shock and all kind of model, didn't take this for granted that after all, as far as Russia is concerned, this is still Russian or Russian allied people. They are people who they think are their brothers. In fact, they, as you know, go back to Kiev, the Rus, as the, one of the originations of the Russian people. So given that, they were not going to use large-scale bombing, flattening of the type that, for instance, the U.S. did in Iraq. That was not the model they were going to do. So the shock and awe model was not what was going to be used. They have targeted military forces of Ukraine, the air defenses, and they have tried to encircle population centers. In this, Kharkiv and Mariupol have been the key ones which have held out. And they have also taken the Donbass region, which is what the target was, Donetsk and uh, Lugansk. Lugansk, which are the two breakaway provinces. And they seem to have controlled that militarily. So they have very clear targets, Odessa. Kiev is another, but more at the moment to encircle Kiev and right. not take it over as of now. And they also have done some strikes in the west, the western part of uh, Ukraine, which are fresh. They haven't struck that earlier, particularly as it seems to be that there is some movement of arms and other uh, materials coming in from, for instance, Poland and other places, and the supply centers for what could be uh, there further are basically located in the western, uh, really the air uh, right. ports over there, which they seem to have struck. There is, of course, a disquieting feature in all this. The Chernobyl, for instance, the power has been blown up. Each side has blamed the other. We now get to get into it. But the question is, yes, these are sensitive issues, because though there is no immediate danger, but those facilities still require power, even if they have been shut down. So those things are quite a reason for worry, as well as there are certain other nuclear plants in Ukraine. Uh, not, uh, I think there are three more nuclear plants in Ukraine. So the one that has been taken over, uh, Zaporozhia and Chernobyl, are two of the larger ones, right. though Chernobyl was inactive for quite some time. There are three more operating plants. All of them are cause for worry in a war, what happens if there is something that goes wrong. As of now, power doesn't seem to be going off in most of the urban areas. Internet seems to be functioning. Therefore, you would say this is un unlike other wars that we have seen, where the US, for instance, has fought, whether it's Libya or whether it is uh, Iraq. So this seems to be, in that sense, a scenario where we should not expect rapid advances. Right. And the pressure on the Ukrainian government is that they settle on the terms that Russia is now dictating to it. And what, how much they will accept or not accept will determine how much the, or how long the war will continue. Right. It does seem that uh, Zelensky's government is willing to accept some of the major conditions. But the neutrality and disarming of Ukraine, because Putin said disarm new train, uh, new Ukraine. Demilitarize and denazify. Demilitarize, uh, denazify and demilitarize. De denazify is a heart and soul question. That's not <laughs> going to be done except for dissolving the Azov battalion, battalion, which is a part of the Ukraine forces now. Some of the key elements who have really become integrated with the Ukrainian government structures. So those are easier to do. But the demilitarization of Ukraine and 
to denazify Ukrainian uh, people's minds towards these forces. That's a different order altogether. Right. So we have to see which way it goes, because as of now, three rounds of discussions have taken place in Belarus, which seems to be more looking at the nuts and bolts of what can or cannot be done in terms of an agreement. While any meeting between Zelensky and uh, Putin will depend on the homework done. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Russians are not at the moment interested in the meeting just for the heck of it, because that doesn't help them. So they think that any meeting that should take place should be after they already have worked out, which is what normally happens when summit meetings take place, right. unless, except for the, uh, what we have seen recently, when the summits didn't produce any results, where already homework is done by both sides, so you know what are the parameters within which the discussion is taking place and whether an agreement is possible or not. So it does seem that we are moving closer to an agreement, but yes, there are still obviously outstanding issues, otherwise it would have been announced already. And therefore, the Russian increase on pressure on the Kiev's uh, government, and you can see the encirclement now, the movement of that uh, tank uh, convoy, which right. was uh, not moving for about a week or so. So all that has now started, which is a pre prelude to really encircling Kiev. And that's, I think, is the key takeaway at that moment, military slow advance and attrition by the Russian forces. Uh, the Ukrainian forces clearly being able to fight in city centers where the Russians are not interested as yet of large-scale destruction. Now Kharkiv and Mariupol seem to be moving in that direction, that civilian uh, facilities will also be attacked. We have to see how much we can uh, get the Ukrainians to come to what the Russians want, whether the Russians will agree to it, that will determine the fate of this uh, war. And I do not think that Russia wants an occupation of Ukraine, right. but if there is no resolution, then what happens? Of course, all bets are off in that case. Absolutely. Prabir, also in the past few weeks, uh, about 10 days, maybe we've seen this massive uh, upsurge, so to speak, in Western society. This is happening at multiple levels. We know, for instance, that uh, brands across uh, the Western world are boycotting or withdrawing from Russia. We have seen this boycott of Russian cultural figures, even from the past, or you know, currently practicing artists, athletes, all that. And there's been a lot of discussion about that. But the deeper structural question really is of sanctions, because that is what everyone is concerned about. This is an impact on oil supplies and gas, of course. It is an impact on food, because Russia and Ukraine import, export a massive amount of wheat. So uh, considering what has been announced till date, especially the US ban on the import of uh, Russian oil, which is uh, quite big, 8% of US uh, imports basically are from Russia. But not only US, but also globally, how do you see these sanctions sort of playing out and what is likely to be their concrete economic impact? You see, there are two other wars that are taking place simultaneously, along with the physical or the military war that is taking place in Ukraine. That is the economic war that you are talking about and the information war. Right. The information war, let's be, let's be very clear. The U.S. and its allies have won the information war from day one. Mm -hmm. In fact, they had won it even before, before the war started. started. Right. So that's taken for granted that Putin is a bad man and Biden, in spite of the fact he was a part of the Iraq war, he was a part of the Afghan war before finally withdrawing from it. He's been a part of the U.S. establishment. Or Euro Maidan, the Euro Maidan coup for that matter. Euro Maidan coup because that time he was very much involved right. in it. So all that is uh, forgotten. So what you see is, of course, that the U.S. is now on the side of angels. And the, while Putin is, of course, the uh, really the Mordor in the, <laughs> <laughs> the right, right. Sauron of the uh, Lord of the Rings, yeah. of the Rings yeah. <laughs> book. So this has been the picture that has been uh, painted. But this started well before any of this. And suddenly they became the defenders of the Russian people against the oligarchs. I wish they would also have the same logic applied to the United States. But well, the oligarchs are actually much bigger than what the U Russian oligarchs are. Uh, and however much you detest the Russian oligarch, there's no comparison in terms of their wealth and their loot to what, for instance, Bezos and company. I think the joke has been that your oligarchs are oligarchs, our oligarchs provide employment opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that is one part of it. The information war, war 
has been won decisively. They control the basic channels that all of us use, YouTube, social media, platforms like Twitter, uh, Facebook. So that's a complete victory. They also control the various internet uh, layers right, right. and they are able to throw out RT. Uh, from even the internet right now, in the, for instance, the television channel is not accessible in India. So RT as a uh, news site you can still access, but you can't see the vi videos. Right. So this has been already the uh, part of the information war. And the U.S. knew from day one, and I'm sure the social, so did Russia, that whatever the freedom of press is, it won't be extended to Russian channels and Russian media. So that is that is very much there comes the economic war. And this is where we enter the completely the great unknown, right. so to say, because this is a level of sanctions we have never seen before. You know, there is a seizure of Russia's, basically, whatever its foreign exchange reserves was with the West. And that's roughly about 300 to 400 billion dollars. Now, these, these reserves, uh, supposedly, are Russia's. But at the same time, if they're frozen, because they are banked with the West, it is held in their currencies, therefore it's held with their uh, central banks, therefore it can be technically frozen, that's what the language that is being used, but for all practical purpose it means being appropriated oh. because Russia cannot use it anymore and the money is still in their banks. Right. So this is the great issue that comes, so what is the implication of this? This is what happened to, for instance, Afghanistan, where you saw nine and a half billion dollars of federal money that Afghanistan had in the federal reserves, federal bank, taken over and distributed by the President of the United States as if it was U.S. money. So you have this example also earlier with Libya. I think there was hundred billion dollars of uh, Libyan reserves in the U.S. and U.K. Uh, somewhere, including their gold, which all again disappeared. We don't know even what happened to it. You had Venezuela's gold, which the right. United Kingdom uh, seized. So you have a whole lot of these examples already. But this is nothing compared to the kind of sanctions now that has been imposed on Russia. And let's not forget, Russia is 11th biggest economy by uh, basically the dollar uh, ruble value. Mm -hmm. Of course, the ruble value has tanked completely at the moment. But in terms of purchasing power parity, which is in some sense another measure of the power of the domestic economy, Russia is the sixth biggest economy in the world. Right. So this is not a small economy. And as you point out, it supplies prior raw materials. Prior, uh, that's why they're being referred to sometimes derogatorily as a petrostate, that they're oil, they supply uh, oil, oil, they supply gas, and also what are called other condensates, which is fuel oil, mm -hmm. uh, naphtha, etc., etc., right. which are used as feedstock for fertilizers. So all of that put together is only one part. Russia also, as you have said, supplies, for instance, grain. It's the largest supplier of wheat apart from Ukraine in the world. I think both put together was 25% of the supply of wheat to the global system. But apart from that, it's also important for agriculture because phosphates, basically the fertilizers, which are required for agriculture, for instance in India, they are again, the largest supplier is Russia. There is also more uh, tricky issues which are coming up when you start unraveling the supply chains of different uh, sectors of the economy. Right. There is also the question of chips. The Russia has been banned from accessing uh, chips manufactured, designed by the United States. Now, that is fine, but then what is not realized, there are certain key elements mm -hmm. to the manufacture of chips, which again require Russia and Ukraine as well. So one of the largest suppliers, basically, of neon is in southern Ukraine and right. under control of the Russians at the moment. You also similarly have the what is called the sapphire substrate, which is important for manufacturing chips. Apparently most of it, particularly the high quality ones, almost entirely come from Russia. So the global supply chains are closely intertwined. 
And if you take the value of the dollar, mm -hmm. not what it is being quoted in, in terms of the financial markets, but you take what its value should be in terms of the real economy. And I'm talking when I'm talking about the real economy, which is what you and I consume or Absolutely. use right. physically, mm -hmm. not the financial instruments, which only the banks and financial players use. If we take that, then today, Unlike what happened in the 50s or 60s, when the US was the major trading partner of almost all parts of the globe, today it's China, which is the Beijing major trading partner all across the globe. So the physical economy does not need the dollar as a means of trade, which is what it did in the 50s and 60s when dollar was the king. Right. Today it is the king because the financial systems are controlled by the United States and the SWIFT banking system, all of these things. But let's be very clear, as long as the physical world gets disconnected in this way from the financial right. <clears throat> world, will the value of dollar start changing? Mm -hmm. And will other countries, that includes India, China, start looking at Russian trade, not in dollars, but in their currencies? Mm -hmm. Now, if that happens, what happens to dollar as a global currency? And of course, it will still be a very important one, so will the euro. But will we see the reflection of the real economy, which is the physical trade that we are seeing, also impact the global financial flows? And will we start seeing that other currencies will slowly replace the dollar and the euro as mode of storing money, storing value, as well as also trade. Now, one important part of it, that when you think of a foreign exchange surplus, you think that's what you will use in future if your trade and you are not able to supply as much as you want to buy. So it's a, uh, something you keep aside for a rainy day. Now, if the rainy day, the supply is not available, then, then will you hold is it? The is there a point of holding a surplus? Is there, is there any value to a balance of payment surplus itself? Or should we all start looking at a zero balance external trade economy? That means we neither, neither have a surplus nor have a deficit because building a future uh, a kitty for your rainy day doesn't seem to work because what you're giving is that you're giving a hostage to the uh, to United States and the European Union, as I have uh, written uh, somewhere that it's like the L L older times when you had to give your children as hostages to the empire, emperor, and they would come up. The, the those who were the fiefs had to do that. Their children would be brought up by the emperor. Right. So this money that you give as a hostage to the United States then or to European Union as what you think are your foreign exchange reserves really are not your reserves. They are essentially hostages that now European Union and the United States have shown they can hold against you in case you disagree with what they are doing. Now, of course, Ukraine war doesn't mean that every country will go to war. But this, of course, doesn't prevent them from going to war, as you have seen France in Africa and as you have seen the US and the NATO around the world. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prabir. We'll be tracking many of these issues in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines as well. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.